Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Politics Matters Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Jakubowski, and today I'm very pleased to announce that we've got another special guest this week. Uh, it's Tenkor on Twitter. He runs the Political Election Projections account, posts pretty good stuff. Go follow him at uh, Tenkor on Twitter. Um, and we're just going to be talking a little Senate map here. We're going to be going through the races that we're going to be watching in November, analyze them, give you a brief rundown of the map, and just see where we're at as of right now. So, uh, Tenkor, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello. I'm Tenkor from Twitter, and I run the PEP account. Everyone knows uh, you already talked it. So that's just a brief intro, and then I think people will get to know me when they do. Yeah, uh, it, he posts bangers. Highly recommend following him. Uh, anyways, we're going to uh, get into this, I guess. We're... We've labeled eight seats that are like competitive to a certain extent. Obviously, some are more competitive than others. Georgia is far more competitive than Ohio or Florida, as is Nevada compared to North Carolina. So we're just going to um, kind of look at this from a perspective of, I guess, Democrats because they're the underdogs, right? But like, they're realistically not going to be winning most of these seats. So we'll we'll start with Wisconsin, uh, and we'll just be assuming it's a run Johnson versus Mandela, uh, Mandela Barnes matchup. Uh, What are your thoughts on that? My take for this election is Mandela Barnes is the wrong type of candidate for 2022. Like, he is more of, like, the progressive sort of uh, Milwaukee, like, sort of kind of Milwaukee Madison sort of liberal kind of candidate. And if you want to win Wisconsin in 2022, the only chance you have is if you sort of, if you make the race a referendum on Ron Johnson, right? And I don't believe Mandela Barnes has the capacity, capability of doing that in a Biden midterm. And if you also look at fundraising numbers, which isn't everything, but against someone like Ron Johnson, in theory, you should be uh, having much stronger fundraising numbers than 1.5 million or whatever he raised this. Somewhere around that, he did raise this uh, this fundraising quarter, but he only raised that about 1.5 million. Johnson already has 7 million uh, in the bank, which fundraising isn't everything. We all know that uh, it could be pretty deceiving, but I don't believe Wisconsin, which is a right trending uh, swing state in a Biden midterm and someone like Barnes, I don't believe is the right candidate to win that seat. So pretty safely lean Republican. Uh, you can make the argument for likely Republican, but I don't see Johnson losing this race really. Yeah, I totally agree. I don't like, especially the Mandela Barnes thing. Like, I don't, he's going to win the primary. He's the most popular Democrat among that electorate within the Democratic Party of Wisconsin. But to be honest, I don't think that he's like the, their guy. Um, you know, Tim, Tim, like the thing that I, uh, don't get about, uh, the people who think that Mandela Barnes is competitive in this race is that, you know, they'll say he's a progressive and like, yeah, that's great. Progressives can win elections, but like, uh, t- the reason Tammy Baldwin won wasn't because she was progressive. It was because she knew how to appeal to Trump voters in Wisconsin. That's why she won so big in 2018. And she was also, of course, aided by the fact that it was a blue wave and that her opponent was uh, pretty low quality. But, like, the issue that Barnes has is that I don't, like you said, I don't see him, like, outperforming or appealing any groups outside of Madison or Milwaukee proper. And that's a problem in the state as rural, as white, and as non-college educated as Wisconsin. So... I read it as likely. I'm pretty, uh, you know, bearish on Mandela Barnes here. I don't see a path for him. Like, everything would have to go right for him to be competitive in this race, you know, to be within a point. So, yeah, I think he loses by something like five or six. Yeah, to win Wisconsin as a Democrat, you need to do two things. Either you overperform in Driftless or you overperform in WoW. I don't believe Barnes has appealed to any of those areas. No. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't really see him cutting up much of a fight there. I mean, he could, he, he'll, he'll be within six, maybe, but it's not going to be that competitive at the end, I believe. I agree. I wouldn't be stunned if Democrats pull out by, like, September. They're like, no, we're going to go back to Georgia or something, because, yeah. I mean, polling might get, like, really, because we don't really have that much polling. Like, there was a poll from last year that had somehow Tom Nelson beating Ron Johnson by, like, four, but we don't have any, I think, I, I don't think we have very much Barnes versus Johnson polling, but when we get it, I I wouldn't be surprised if it's like Johnson plus five and it's pretty bad for Democrats. Uh, I mean, it, Wisconsin polls, you, you, yeah, I mean, mean, yeah, less than reliable. 
Yeah, maybe Johnson and Barnes are neck and neck, and people are like, oh my god, this race is a toss up, and then oh, oh, no, just I'm Johnson wins by like five on election day. Oh, that that's the most Democratic Party thing to happen ever. I'm like, I'm getting Kansas and South Carolina flashbacks from last time. Uh, right. Anyways, yeah. So um, I think next in the list would be North Carolina. So um, I'll let you take this one because I want to hear your thoughts on that primary between, you know, Bud and McCrory. Right. At this point, Bud is favored. Uh, I don't really think there's much argument to be made there. McCrory had, he had a good run in my opinion, like, he held out way longer than I expected uh, for a former governor. Uh, my opinion, Bud isn't really being propped up by the Trump endorsement as much as he is being propped up by outside spending by the club club of growth. It, like if the Trump endorsement was a big deal, then he would have rose in like much earlier uh, than now. And people, I think, are starting to see the primary voters are starting to see some vulnerabilities in the potential um, McCory kind of candidacy for that seat. Uh, McCory would be the weaker uh, nominee for Republicans, in my opinion, since he lost a completely winnable governor's race and he had some unpopular kind of positions in some areas. And I don't think the people of North Carolina has forgotten, but, uh, but I think Bud at this point is pretty much favored, probably wins. North Carolina does have a runoff system, but it's 30%. It's the, the bar is really low, so I don't really see Bud not being able to clear 30. Yeah. Yeah, I, that, that wouldn't surprise me either. I haven't been following that primary as much, which is kind of why I asked you first, but I, like, I think I'll agree. Uh, the, I think the latest poll had Bud ahead in the primary, although I, 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 I'm pretty sure McCrory was in second. Um, but I, but I find it really interesting that Bud, like you said, hasn't like, totally you know ran away with it because of the trump endorsement like i think we're noticing that the trump endorsement still holds a lot of effect within these primaries evidently you know in ohio jd vance obviously we're likely going to see him win that primary now just because of that trump endorsement but like you know in state like alabama with mo brooks who lost the endorsement or in the texas i, I think the fifth district election last year where trump endorsed uh susan wright and then she lost to jake elsey uh, so there are, you know, there are certainly instances where the Trump endorsement doesn't, you know, end up being a guarantee for the person who gets it. But in this primary, it looks like Bud's going to win. So then in a Bud versus Beasley matchup, who do you got and by how much? I would probably say Bud by about five due to the just to the national environment. I don't really see it happening for Beasley. I mean, Beasley is not a bad candidate to say, but like she isn't like enough to overcome a R plus three or whatever generic ballot that is inevitable for this, uh, for this year. So, and the, the one thing that has like a sort of wild card to it, there's always some libertarian candidate for some Senate race that always gets 4% for some random reason. But I don't really see that making a huge difference. Is there a libertarian in this race yet or do we not know? I, I'm not sure, but. Historically, there's always this one libertarian dude that takes like three to four percent of the vote for some random reason. But Shane Hazel. <laughs> okay. Shane yeah. Hazel. So, yeah, Shane Hazel, by the way, those who know, who is a libertarian who cost David Perdue his Senate race because he got like I want to say two or three percent of the vote, and Perdue was a couple thousand votes away from not even doing the runoff. But that's the story for another time. Um, point being, North Carolina. Yeah, I. I'll, I'll agree. I'd, I'd say five is kind of the over under for that race. Uh, Bud definitely beats Beasley, and I I have to think she's a pretty good candidate. Like it's like if we got the Senate race in a D favorable, even neutral year, I think it'd be you know pretty close to toss up territory. But uh, for Beasley, it's just she's in a Republican year. Biden's not popular. She's in a state where I think uh, it's pretty reasonable to expect black turnout to drop. Uh, and you know, obviously, black voters in North Carolina are. It, it, definitely come out for the Democratic Party. I think Biden got something like 87% of the black vote in the state in 2020. So uh, Democrats do benefit from having higher black turnout. And if that drops, that's really bad for Beasley. Um, that being said, I do want to say that I think that this race, like, so it hasn't gotten a ton of attention because, like, yeah, you'll see the occasional uh, competitive Beasley versus McCrory poll. But, like, I think that we've all, as a, I, I guess, what whatever's left of the election community on Twitter or whatever has kind of come to the consensus that uh, that Bud's going to beat Beasley by something like five, you know, around around that five percent margin. 
Uh, I think that Bud actually isn't that great of a candidate. It, like, it's like he won't lose, but I, I I wouldn't be stunned if he goes to three or four territory and if it takes a little longer to call him election night. But I mean, Ted yeah. Bud is just like generic Republican. Like, he doesn't really have any qualities. He's just generic Republican, right? So, but that's enough to win twenty twenty two for a oh yeah Republican yeah state. it's yeah definitely yeah. Well, if you're a Republican in the 2022 midterms, the only thing you have to do is not seriously mess up, and you should be winning your races because evidently it's a red year. Um, okay, uh, what are your thoughts on Ohio? Obviously, we can talk a little GOP primary if you want, but it looks like Vance is going to get that nomination. What do you think? I do think Vance is slightly favored. Now, in every primary, I do want to think it of more of a geographic kind of war because that's what usually happens in the primaries. People have their geo geographic advantages and the big thing about the trump endorsement in ohio is it significantly helps out vance in the appalachian region which trump is immensely popular in and if you look at the other candidates in the race none of them really have any connections to the appalachian area like jan timken is from star county which is probably the closest to that but if you look at it mandel is strongest in the kind of cincinnati and the Cleveland area, if you look at his 2012 primary performance, uh, it, uh, Gibbons has the Cuyahoga County GOP endorsement, and the Franklin County GOP endorsement is for State Senator Matt Dolan, but none of the candidates really have any kind of support in the Appalachian area, which I believe a Trump endorsement probably helps out Vance uh, quite a bit in that area, and that probably gets him uh, an advantage in the nomination process. Oh, yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, and also, I think that we need to, uh, and I'll get back to you in a second about this. I think that in terms of Ohio in, in that primary, uh, Mandel might do, like you said, uh, he, he might do okay in the suburbs of Cleveland, Cincinnati. But I think that his fundamental problem from the start was with working class to rural, you know, blue collar issue voters in the uh, southeastern part of the state in Appalachia. And the Trump endorsement kind of just put the nail in that coffin. Because if Mandel got it, I think he's still you know, he's still got game there, right? But with Vance getting an endorsement, and you know, obviously that block of voters is predictably Trumpy, I think kind of seals the deal, and I think Vance gets the nomination. So uh, just because I think Ohio's fun, uh, what do you think the co- – because obviously J.D. Vance be favored to beat Tim Ryan, despite the fact that Tim Ryan's doing you know what, what I consider to be a pretty good campaign. What do the geographic coalitions look like to you in a general election of Ryan versus Vance? I think Mahoning probably votes Ryan, in my opinion, since he's from there and he's decently popular. He's running a decent campaign. But I do believe the suburbs will probably slightly revert because down ballot and the national environment and all that. But I think Ryan has the chance of getting a few working class areas from the northeastern area of the state where he is from and he is popular. And at the end of the day, I think Vance probably wins around a 10 percent margin, which is a decent performance for Ryan, no doubt, for uh, this national environment. But at the end of the day, Ohio is just too Republican to win. Uh, I do believe the north kind of west area is kind of interesting since none of the candidates really have that much sort of ties there and none of the candidates but the northwest area is pretty important because there is a pretty important house race uh ohio with nine yeah with, with copter. copter uh but that that one's interesting we might if we could see uh ryan overperform there might might be able to save copter in that house race but overall i do think at the end of the day ryan overperforms in the northeast and kind of vance sort of just generalizing overperforming trump in the more in the rest of the state, really. Uh, and that probably gives them a decent win at the end. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and actually, while we're on the topic of House of Performances, or I guess of Performances in Regions by Tim Ryan, that would help out House Democrats. Cincinnati, you've got the first district, which is going to be quite competitive this year. It's a, I want to say, Biden was seven or eight seat that's got Steve Tappet, the incumbent Republican, looking to hold off what looks like a pretty, uh, you know, It'll be a pretty interesting challenge from whoever the Democrats put up in that race because it's a Biden seat in a Republican favored midterm in an area that's trending blue, sure. But in 2022, we're not sure if it'll be enough to unseat Steve Cabot. So um, if Tim Ryan does well enough in Cincinnati, you, you know, he probably wouldn't win the race. But, you know, you could be looking at a Democratic pickup in that first district in Cincinnati. 
And then you could also be looking at Tim Ryan kind of narrowing that gap in the state uh, in the state legislature because those elections have been 2022. So then um, I'll relay this back to you in a second. You said that uh, you're expecting Ryan to lose by somewhere around 10. I'd be impressed if he can uh, lose by or I think Biden. How much did Biden lose Ohio by? Who else did by like I want to say eight now? OK, he lost about eight. Yeah. So if um, if Ben, it, no, Mandel. If Ryan manages to over to overperform in, in the sense that he manages to lose by uh, under eight, what do you think that means? Just because we're having fun here, what do you think that a narrower Ryan loss would mean for shared run in twenty twenty four? I mean, I don't really think it means anything. I mean, like a, a, an underperformance is really just candidate quality, in my opinion. I mean, a Senate race, I don't really think translate into much about the state trend. I, I really just think it's a candidate quality thing. And I mean, sure, Brown, I mean, he could still win in 2024, but I, he would start as an underdog, in my opinion, uh, to any kind of Republican in that year. But you don't think that like a, like uh, Ryan doing OK here in a red wave would make you rethink your whole shared is doomed thing? Or do you just think he's done no matter what? He's not done by any means. It's probably like tilt to lean are which isn't oh, okay i mean he, he he's he has a chance of winning in, in my opinion but if you're looking at if you're looking at the potential 2024 republican bench right there are a decent lot there's a decent lineup there and none of them declared for this race but i do believe probably like uh dave yost is i believe the secretary of state he has some ideas about running for that i mean uh yos is the attorney general but he does i think he has some ideas of running for that seat and i think there's a decent lineup to challenge brown i like this clown card republican primary that we have right now oh this is the this is i think most chaotic primary of the year is definitely go like you could sum up that ohio republican primary with that uh gibbons mandel skirmish at the microphone and that debate stage that was that was goofy to say the least uh oh my god yeah so you've got uh okay so then next i guess we'll go on and this isn't uh by the way this isn't our competitiveness but we want to talk a little bit about it uh florida obviously going to go to marco rubio but we might as well we're on the topic of florida talk a little bit about this demings versus rubio matchup and what it could mean for the future because obviously democrats are right now at a pretty low point in florida right uh florida right now the florida democratic party has in the past few years found a way to mess up everything they had going for them and then some so uh what do you think we're going to see in florida and how bad does it get for the democrats here in november uh rubio wins by more than he does in 2016 i don't think there's really much talk about this but rubio probably wins easily i mean there's really no debate here it's a trump plus three state and rubio's a popular incumbent and real demings is a fine candidate she has raised a boatload of cash and she's she has a pretty impressive resume but i don't really see her really putting up much of a fight and democrats are not really putting much in florida i mean if you look at the uh senatorial committee uh what the democratic senatorial committee is okay focusing on you see florida is just not on the list uh if you look at what the governor's association is looking on you see there are reports that the Democratic Governors Association is pulling out of Florida because they don't really think they could beat DeSantis. I just think at the end of the day, there's just not enough institutional support for Demings to even come close to Rubio. And I mean, Miami Dade is an interesting conversation yeah, we could have. Uh, but Rubio lost it by 11 last time. So I would probably incline to say he wins it this time around due to the trends in that area. But we don't know how down ballot is really affected yet uh, from the 2020 results. We don't really have any data points to go from, so I wouldn't be surprised if Demings does win Miami Day. But I would probably say Rubio is favored to win that win that county, and I think that's that's probably what we're supposed to be looking at here in Florida is who wins Miami Day. <laughs> that's the more interesting yeah. conversation. Imagine that, that, like imagine telling that to someone in 2016, they'd be like, "No, it's a." Clinton was 30 county. Well, now it's more competitive in the state as a whole in the Senate race. Just so it goes to show how much the Democratic Party in that state has fallen off. And, you know, I'm really interested to see how Miami votes because it's 
you know, it's like, I don't really like, it's obviously it's trending right, but I don't know how bad it's going to get because it could get really bad or could only get, you know, marginally bad for Democrats. So I'm interested right. to see that. Um, so next we're going to get to our, what, what I like to call the big four, which are the four seats that I think are going to realistically be within, you know, five points. And those are obviously um, the states of Georgia, Nevada, Arizona, Pennsylvania. We're also going to talk a little New Hampshire right now, but I wanted to say that we're going to get into the big four after New Hampshire. And I say New Hampshire is kind of ostracized from that big four region because it's really swingy. I wouldn't be stunned if it, you know, goes like if it's competitive and we get a race where Hassan only wins by two or three. But I also wouldn't be stunned if she wins by 10. And as, as I like to say, New Hampshire is one giant suburb and it'll trend with the rest of the suburbs in the country. So where, where's your head at for that Senate race? New Hampshire, it depends on it heavily depends on the Republican nominee. Uh, New Hampshire is one of few states left that really depends on candidate quality. It's most of New England as well. I mean, it's a really candidate yeah, based Susan state. Collins. I mean, in this environment, if Sununu was running, I, I don't really think there would be too much debate who would be favored in here. And, wait, and there's still no debate who's favored in here because he's not running. Therefore, Hassan is favored to win this race. However, if you're looking at the three candidates, actually, like, there are five in that, in that but there's three main candidates. Uh, the state Senate president, Chuck Morse, he is leading in fundraising and probably has the institutional support and the establishment backing. And then there's the uh, uh, general, Don Bulldog, which is the far right candidate, but he has the more grassroots sort of backing. But he has raised, like, a pathetic amount of cash. So there's thoughts maybe he won't be able to perform as strongly as initially anticipated in the primary. And then there's town manager, uh, Kevin Smith, who is kind of more of a third wheel type candidate, who is a more of a younger, kind of more newer kind of uh, sort of candidate that in, in this race. But at the moment, it seems like it's Morrison Bulldog who's really uh, competing for that. And if, if Morrison's the nominee, there is talk that there could be a stronger third party challenge uh, because New Hampshire is, you know, New Hampshire likes their libertarian third parties, right? Yeah. And Morse is not really popular with them. So if Morse is the nominee, you could see maybe a stronger libertarian candidate. If Bulldog's the nominee, I mean, he has his own problems. He really does not fit well with the New Hampshire electorate. Uh, so I think both candidates probably have their own problems. And I would, I would be, I wouldn't be surprised if Morse won that race, but I would be mildly, su I would be my, I mean, I would, I would be like, it would intrigue me how he won if he did win that race. It would probably mean like the national environment is terrible for Democrats. Uh, Bulldog, I really don't see a path for him to win because he is just not the right candidate yeah. for the district. Overall, I would say Hassan is in a good position to pull this off um, at the end of the day. So, Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think she wins. I'm more interested to see how like, because New Hampshire is kind of like a, a group of more white college educated suburbs and then like if those areas like i don't think that they're that that they'll get uh that they'll trend enough towards the republican party to flip the race but like if we see like this nationwide just bolting of these suburbs to the right new hampshire should be interesting to watch but uh yeah so now we're going to get into the big four starting with pennsylvania where uh two weeks ago dr oz received the endorsement of donald trump which basically locked up the primary for him against david mccormick uh, and it looks like John Fetterman is going to get the Democratic nomination. Connor Lamb, you know, at first he announced last summer, I thought that he'd, you know, have a good chance of winning the primary. But right now it looks like his campaign's uh, dead. So what are your thoughts on an Oz versus uh, Fetterman mashup? Uh, I just want a quick touch in the primary. So uh, yeah, sure. Fetterman is pretty much easily going to win at this rate. I mean, Lamb isn't even putting up any ads on air, which is very interesting. Like... Bro, you're Does he even want at this point? What are you doing right now? Yeah. Uh, but there's, there's, this is, I want, I want a quick touch on this inter interesting kind of primary in this Democratic side. There's a third candidate, Malcolm Kenyatta, who's kind of a more kind of Philadelphia orientated, progressive activist candidate. 
And I wouldn't, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if he has a much stronger showing than expected because in Pennsylvania, the primaries are highly regional and they actually put the home county on the ballot. So Kenyatta is the only of major candidates that is from the Philly region. And then we know Lamb and Fetterman are from Western Pennsylvania. So I wouldn't be surprised if we could see Kenyatta have a much stronger performance than expected, especially with his base in the kind of Philly region. And now to the Republican primary, we could see, I don't, I don't buy the idea that McCormick is dead yet, but I do think probably Oz at this point has a, has a slight edge. The difference between the regular Trump endorsement and the Trump endorsement in Pennsylvania is unlike a lot of other candidates, we see Dr. Dr. Oz has the money and resources to actually advertise the Trump endorsement, which is a massive benefit. Uh, because if you look at some other candidates, they don't have as much money or the resources as Dr. Oz to kind of advertise and no one knows that they're actually endorsed by Trump. So they just go vote for whoever they decide to vote. But having, letting the people know uh, that you're endorsed by Donald Trump, like having the electorate know is a massive benefit in a state, uh, which the Republican electorate is still pretty pro-Trump. If you look at the Republican primary in 2016, Trump won like a majority of the vote here in the state of Pennsylvania. But McCormick does have one big advantage in this primary in that he is the only candidate from Western Pennsylvania. And in theory, if you, in theory, Western Pennsylvania is enough for a singular candidate to win, especially if you're looking at the type of vote splitting that we are about to see with Oz and there's a, there are a whole other basket of candidates that are from the Philadelphia region. And, but if we're looking at a McCormick and Oz sort of showdown, you would probably expect McCormick to have like massive margins in the Western area. And then it depends on if Oz could kind of hold his own in the Philadelphia region. There are more votes in the Philadelphia region, but there's more vote splitting. Uh, in, uh, there's also more, more vote splitting in the Philly region. So that, that's the interesting dynamic in the race. And we all know McCormick has loads of money, so he is not out of this thing right as of right now. So uh, I'm actually going to disagree with you there. I think McCormick's done. And I say that because, so you're right in that if he were to win this primary, hypothetically speaking, his base would probably be from Western Pennsylvania. But the issue that I have with that is that he was one of uh, a group of more moderate Republicans in 2013 who signed, uh, I think it was a brief that was basically stating a, the, the Repu- a group of Republicans in support of gay marriage, which is great if you're running as a moderate and a more liberal state. But it's not good if you're running in a Republican in a Republican primary with an electorate that's generally speaking hostile towards the concept of gay marriage. Uh, again, uh, like the number of Republicans who are going to support gay marriage in the future is growing. But I don't think it's certainly not a majority, especially in a state like Pennsylvania. We've got a lot of more conservative and economically and or not more, more socially right wing uh, voters in Western Pennsylvania. So if McCormick were, you know, to be like uh, I, m- less socially liberal and less, you know, Bush ad- administration type neocon from 15 years ago, I think that he'd be doing better in Western Pennsylvania. But I just like he's just not the right fit, in my opinion, for the region of the state against Oz, which is why I think he's going to get crushed in the primary. I mean, I would I, I would agree with you, but I think McCormick's opponent, which is Oz, makes up for that. I mean, it's kind of hard for Oz to rub off this perception of being this. Hollywood liberal sort of stereotype, you know, like it, there definitely exists kind of this perception that Dr. Oz is a like kind of New Jersey transplant Hollywood liberal sort of type candidate. I don't I don't disagree that Dr. Oz, I think at this point is definitely favored for the reasons I pointed out. He could he has money to advertise his Trump endorsement and uh, McCormick is not the best alternative to kind of compete with that type of advantage. But I don't believe McCormick is like zero percent chance of winning. I think it's more like it's more like a sixty-five thirty-five sort of sort of sort of kind of I guess 
proposition at this point. Interesting. Okay. So then, uh, in a general, it's Fetterman versus, all, we'll just assume it's Oz. You yeah. have McCormick at a one, a run of one third chance of winning him. Uh, and I've got him at like maybe 15, 20, if that. So in an Oz versus Fetterman matchup, general, who do you think wins and what do the coalitions look like? I mean, at, just because of the national environment alone, I think Oz probably has a slight advantage. Now, there are, there are, there are a few things that come into the play in this type of in, in this type of matchup, and the most important kind of thing for a Democrat to win Pennsylvania is the type of turnout and margin they get out of the Philadelphia region. And I don't believe John Fetterman is the best candidate to win kind of the Philadelphia black voter and turn them out in a, in a year like 2020 where Dem- Democrats will obviously be suffering from a massive turnout problems in Philadelphia. Now, there's Josh Shapiro is on the ballot for governor, which might help him out a little bit in that front, but I don't really see that being a huge benefit. Now, there is this kind of worry about among Republican circles that Oz is kind of not pal- palatable towards the GOP base, and maybe some of the more rural kind of kind of voters will lean towards Fetterman in a, the more working class kind of ancestral Democratic base, but I think in a Biden midterm, in like an anti-Biden, the, the voters are more anti-Biden than they are kind of pro a singular candidate. Now, Fetterman could prove me wrong by being a really strong candidate for the white working class. Maybe that does happen, but I don't really see it happening in a midterm like this one, uh, where people are probably casting their ballot to oppose Joe Biden more than they're casting a ballot to Oppose Dr. Oz, for instance, uh, in a type of scenario. Now, I do believe, uh, at the end of the day, Fetterman does overperform in Western Pennsylvania because of regionalism, uh, kind of, there is still a little bit of regionalism in play, even in a general election in Pennsylvania. But I don't believe at the end of the day it is enough. I don't believe Fetterman is the right candidate, especially for the Philadelphia region where a Democrat must run up large margins if they are to have a prayer in the rest of the state. Yeah, I agree. I think Fetterman, like Fetterman, uh, so I think Fetterman could be one of two things. At best, he's, you know, a Tammy Baldwin or like, I'm not saying he won by 11, but like at best he, you know, ekes out a narrow win in the Senate race and is like a Tammy Baldwin or Sherrod Brown figure and that he's a progressive who Champion to the working class can win, you know, Trump voters, yada, yada, yada. At worst, he's another Mandela Barnes, because, like, let's just, I'll be blunt here. I think Mandela Barnes gets, like, murdered in Wisconsin. I don't think he's going to do anything. And I think that in, like, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's, like, you know, November, or December, and we're just like, yeah, that was uh, a really poorly run campaign. Because, like, what I'm seeing so far is no attempt to reach out to the, 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 the Trump vote in that state, in the state that's so, you know, likely to be Trumpy in the future. But back to Pennsylvania. Uh, Fetterman, I think, uh, he can be both, but it really comes down to how well, like you said, he does with rural or working class voters in Western Pennsylvania, especially in Westmoreland, which is, you know, the kind of excerpts of Pittsburgh or Beaver, which are more working class areas adjacent to Ohio and West Virginia. And so once you get into that region, it really, you know, if, if Fetterman can not revert, but if he can get some of those areas to come back a little bit to Democrats, that's great for him. If not, he's probably doomed because, again, Philadelphia is not going to be great because he's not the right fit for that region. And then lastly, just rapid fire before we move on to our uh, final three races. Uh, do you think Fetterman does better or better than Biden, worse than Biden, or about on par in the Scranton area? Scranton, I think slightly worse because Biden is from that area and he probably got a hometown boost. But that area is slightly more uh, down ballot Democratic, so there's a yeah. chance he might do better. But I, I think the national environment just pushes it slightly towards Oz uh, a little bit more than it did for Trump. Yeah, I agree. I I, I I'm just a nerd for Grant. I just wanted to. I was just curious. Um, okay, so then we're gonna get into our final three races. Uh, so let's talk about Georgia first, where of uh, those of you who don't know. So I don't think this report is like going to come to fruition. And if it did, it would come in like, you know, fall, like September, October. But I read a report uh, and the report's still relevant that 
uh, Herschel, or that the GOP is not encouraged by Herschel Walker and is considering, not for sure, but they're considering pulling out of Georgia. So, first of all, um, I don't think that's going to happen. And if it did happen, it would require a lot of things to go right for Democrats. It would require the GOP to like need to like rescue Dr. Oz or, you know, try to beat Mark Kelly or Cortez Masto instead and just give up on Georgia. But for now, they can afford to, you know, play a, a bit of a wider map. Um, but the issue that Republicans have with Walker is that I don't think that he's the right fit for Georgia. Like the people who say, and I'll, I'll relay this back to you in a second, but the people who say that, uh, you know, Herschel Walker's going to win just because he's he was a legend running back at University of Georgia. Like, that's cool and all. I'm a football fan. I Like, I can appreciate that. But I don't think that, A, uh, I think a lot of people would realize it does make him qualified for public office. If you're obviously, I'm not saying he is or isn't. I'm just saying there are a lot of people who are going to think that. And B, like, he was a running back during the 70s and 80s at, at Georgia. And so the, the voters who watched him play there are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And so if... Like, I think it's pretty safe to say that seniors are going to back Republicans by a lot this midterm. But like, if, um, like, I don't think it convinces anyone. And I think that if Walker does win, it'll be because of an overperformance in the suburbs. So what do you think in a Walker versus Warnock matchup? I, I mean, the one thing that Republicans should avoid in this midterm is making it about candidate versus candidate in each matchup. Just make everything a referendum on Biden. I think that is yeah. definitely the best strategy. But a Herschel Walker candidacy does not help that cause because there's a potential that the race becomes a referendum on Herschel Walker rather than a referendum on Biden, which is not what you want as a candidate. Now, I do want to say the one good thing about having Herschel Walker as a candidate is he could raise a boatload of cash and we all know Warnock is a fundraising machine. Like that is, he just he has like twenty five million on hand right now. But he Walker is the only candidate on the GOP side that could keep up. Now, regarding what you said about the GOP pulling out of Georgia, there's basically no chance that happens because you only have so many offensive opportunities. And unless Rick Scott is dumb, which he has shown in, which I mean isn't a bad. I guess assumption to make, but <laughs> it, uh, like unless like John Ron Johnson is down five points in the polls and they he, they need to rescue him, and Doctor Oz is like down ten points in the polls and they need to rescue him as well, and Cherry Beasley is somehow leading right in North Carolina. If you're if you're going that kind of direction where Republicans are just scrambling on the in in the rest of the Senate map, which is I mean, very unlikely to happen given the environment. There are only three states Republicans really need to invest, plus Pennsylvania, which is maybe four. So, and and the Mitch McConnell has like more than a hundred million like on hand. So I really don't see any intention or incentive for Republicans to pull out of Georgia just because they have a potentially bad candidate. Yeah, I, uh, I'm on board with that. I, like, again, I wasn't saying he would, obviously, you know, this, but I just want to convey, I, like, I don't think they'd pull up, but it would, like you said, it would, it would require a lot of things to happen across the board. And, you know, those things aren't necessarily lucky to happen. So, uh, while we're on the topic of Georgia in this, uh, Warnock versus Walker matchup, which is like 99% going to be the matchup, uh, do you think, because obviously both, uh, both Warnock and Walker's path to victory are through suburban Atlanta, you know, in your, when that's to, uh, Gwinnett's, Henry, Cobbs, North Fulton, and uh, e, uh, Newton. Do you think that, because in 2021, Warnock did quite well with suburban Atlanta. He won by two, and he ran about even maybe a little behind Biden in most of the suburbs of Atlanta. Do you think that that continues, or do you think he just keeps the trends going and wins this race again? I mean, it depends on how the campaign progresses. I mean, if you're just doing a generic kind of matchup with Warnock and Walker, if the election were held today, I don't think he gets those margins. Let, let, me, let me just put it that way. If the election were held today, Cobb is within 10 points, Gwinnett is within 15, et cetera, et cetera, and mm-hmm. you probably see Warnock go down. But it depends on how the campaign is run. I mean, if Walker fumbles a lot and perhaps uh, then... Pun intended? 
then the Canada quality could overcome the national environment. You could see we're not doing much better. Uh, but at the end of the day, I do think that there is one very intriguing scenario because there's a libertarian in this race. We could see a runoff again. God mm. forbid we don't have another runoff that decides the Senate majority. But if uh, at this, if Walker is to win, I mean, Warnock is to win. It has to be through better margins in the Atlanta suburbs because I don't see, I don't see the base in the kind of black belt rural Georgia where they're mostly rural African Americans. I don't really see the base turning out as strong, uh, because it's a midterm election and the rural black voters are very unreliable turnout base. So if you are to win, you would have to convert much more kind of white suburbanites in the Atlanta area that are more swingy. Uh, let's just say there's, it's more, they're more elastic voters. And if there's, that is, I think the pathway for, uh, Walker, uh, for Warnock to win, he probably needs 60% of the vote in Gwinnett County, I would assume, if he is to pull off a victory. Yeah, uh, that path, the O-line is really well done. I don't have any disagreements with that. I think, uh, yeah, that's what needs to happen for uh, a, a, a Walker victory. Um, so then we've got the last two, which are Nevada and, and uh, Arizona. So in Arizona, we're getting – so we don't know who Trump's going to endorse between uh, Jim L- – is it Lamone or Lynn? Do you know if it's Lamone or Lynn? I, would just, I don't even know. <laughs> I mean, he I, I, I learned who he was literally a week ago. So, yeah. um, But that random poll that had him in second place was like, – I think he funded it, but – Whatever. Uh, it'll be because Trump has dissed Mark Brnovich like multiple times. He basically corroborated the belief that he's not going to endorse Brnovich in his statement over the weekend in which he said, like, I think he basically just said he didn't like Brnovich because of his inability to overcome the 2020 election in Arizona. And so that leaves Masters and Lannon as the two guys who are going to be duking it out for the Trump nomination. And so, uh, A, who do you think gets that uh, the, the Trump not nom- the, the Trump endorsement? Uh, between Masters and uh, Lamb, and, and who do you think uh, would have a better chance of beating Mark Kelly? Uh, I mean, I would think Masters is favored for the endorsement because because he has uh, ties to Peter Theo, which is a billionaire who has strong ties to Trump, and he's funding Masters' campaign. Now, the thing that may, will make, I would say, Trump hesitant to endorse Masters Masters is pulling at a distant third place right now in the polls. And I don't think Trump really wants to risk it that much. I mean, he already saw what happened in Alabama and what happened in uh, Alabama, what happened in he's seeing uh, Purdue kind of struggle in Georgia. I don't think he really wants to risk that big endorsement. But we did see him endorse in Pennsylvania and endorse in Ohio, which are kind of risky but not that risky moves but so we'll see what happens in arizona as of the republican primary i think jim lamon is not very i i don't really see him as a uh proved candidate i don't really think you could judge him in a one way or the other as of yet i don't think we don't i don't we don't we just don't know much about this dude you know like he just can't came out of nowhere like Three weeks ago, when we saw a poll having him up, uh, an internal poll having him up. So uh, I think we need to see what we have from this dude. But I, 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 I would probably assume uh, he could self fund, which is a big plus since he's a solar billionaire. I'm a millionaire kind of businessman type kind of person. Uh, Blake Masters, on the other hand, I would probably assume he's a, a below average candidate for a state like Arizona. He has a more populist sort of messaging, which I don't believe is the right messaging for a state of, for the state like Arizona. I mean, just look at Trump. I mean, he lost the state of Arizona, which is supposed to be pretty reliably Republican state. So I think Masters is an under average and Lamin, I, I, I probably, we probably need to see more from him before we can make a definitive conclusion. Bronovich, who has been kind of killed by Trump because because he's doing the right thing from a legal perspective, but Trump does not like that for reasons that I think we don't need to specify. Uh, he he's just sort of a generic Republican who has 
won before, right? He's just a generic R, which is basically what you need to win Arizona. But of course, Arizona Republicans are making this much harder than they need to be by not, not by nominating more unknown candidates, uh, potentially nominating Masters or Lamin as their nominee, which makes Arizona Senate race more in flux than what you would probably expect for a midterm year. Yeah, I, I, I mean, absolutely. I personally think uh, I'm on the kind of Mark Kelly is done train because I just don't see him doing well with, you know, your suburban Phoenix voters and then Hispanics. But um, race definitely competitive. Uh, we'll get back to it at the uh, very last segment of the show. We'll briefly just give our margins for both these races. And lastly, Nevada, which I find to be the most interesting race of the cycle with uh, Catherine Cortez Masto likely facing Adam Laxalt. We'll just assume that. If you want to talk about that primary, you can in a second, but I think it's Laxalt, Mast- Cortez Masto. Um, and I think Cortez Masto wins. So the beef that I have with the people that – no, not the beef. I, sh- I shouldn't say beef. But, like, the the fundamental disagreement that I have with the people who say that Nevada is going to trend right enough to carry Laxalt to a win in 2022 is that – I don't think Biden really did anything in Nevada. Like the fact that he won Nevada by 2.4% with running essentially no campaign there, having atrocious um, appeal to Hispanics. And, you know, the COVID lockdowns in Vegas really, I, I guess, hampered the state's economy and hurt the Democratic Party within that, you know, southern region. So uh, I think that if Biden actually like need to win, if Biden actually tried to win it, he would have probably gotten, you know, four or five point margin which is why I think I'm a bit more optimistic for Cortez Master now that COVID is obviously better now than it was in 2020 and that uh, the Democrats, I think, will have a better operation with Hispanics, uh, especially with someone like Cortez Master who has proved that she's able to do well with Hispanics. So I think she makes lack salt, but uh, I'll hand it over to you for our final. Uh, yeah. I mean, Nevada is an interesting state because you have a, you basically have two states. You have three states, actually. You have the Clark County, which is, very diverse, diverse place, primarily, uh, if you want to say the swing kind of like the, the, the demographic that decides elections, uh, you have the Hispanic kind of area. And then you have, you have the Reno, what, Reno area, which is Washoe County, the kind of more white liberal California transplant sort of area. And you have the rest of the state. Now, I do believe because of the national environment and things like that. And Cortez Masto was slightly weaker in the non-Clark areas. I do believe, I, I think Lacko will probably run ahead of Trump in the rural and Washoe County. Mm-hmm. Now, this race will be decided in Clark. And I think, I think the Democratic kind of coalition in Clark County is not reliable enough for them to win in a midterm year. It's mostly non college, non, non, non college educated Hispanic voters, which is a very kind of very hard demographic to turn out and a very kind of swingy demographic depending on which election it goes. So I don't, I don't think CCM pulls this out, but she could. Um, if she gets, she needs to overperform Biden with Hispanic voters because I think Laxalt will probably outperform Trump with everything else. So if we see CCM overperforming it with Hispanics in Clark County, she probably needs to win the county by eight points minimum to win the state. Uh, but I think that's her only path is a strong overperformance with Hispanic voters and higher than expected turnout with that demographic. Yeah, um, I'm going to disagree on that one, but, uh, I think that, I think, like, like, you're, you're not wrong. Uh, it, re- it really comes down to, uh, Clark. And like you said, on one hand, there is certainly the element of the Democratic Party not going to be able to, you know, are they able to turn out Hispanics without degrees in the city of Las Vegas? And on the other hand, um, can Adam Laxalt hold on to that Trump base in the rural area, do better in Washoe while simultaneously flipping some voters in Clark or getting turned out to decrease with Democratic voters. So um, for, for, for the last part of the show, we're just going to do a brief relay of these four races or the five races that we talked about at the end, just to see where we all stand here. Um, so I've got, for those who've been listening to the show consistently, who watch my YouTube channel or follow me on Twitter, you'll know that I've got Democrats at 48 seats. Like I said, they've got the 46 that are pretty safe, plus New Hampshire, 
uh, and then plus Nevada, which is the competitive race I think they hold on to, but they lose Pennsylvania, Arizona, and Georgia. Uh, how many, like, I know uh, we talked about this briefly before the show, but, like, if I dragged your feet to the fire, how many seats do you think the Democratic Party has in the Senate uh, at the end of 2022? And, uh, you know, if they're at 47, how much do they lose the three by? And if they're at 48 or 49, how much do they, you know, win those two races by and why? I would say 48. 48 at the end. Fundamentally, Democrats should lose three seats, Arizona, Georgia, and Nevada, but there's always this one race that the GOP will fumble. Like, I have no doubt in my mind there's going to be some fumble somewhere. Georgia is the one that is probably the highest on that list of potential fumbles because of the there's potential candidate problems that might happen. But there's also this runoff scenario that we all dread because of the fifty okay. percent rule, which I think that probably is the biggest wild card there. Uh Nevada I'm bullish on for the Republicans because of the whole turnout thing, but I could be wrong definitely. I'm not a god and legend. <laughs> I could be wrong about Nevada, definitely. But I think Nevada I'm the most bullish on because of the uh turnout demographics and the uh, and the CCM is just sort of a generic dem, and she doesn't have as much sort of brand as Mark Kelly does in Arizona. And I think Arizona probably goes Republican, but that one is sort of more in flux because of the potential problems Republicans could have with their nominees. But I think median outcome is probably about 48 Democratic seats at the end of the day. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm, I've got them at 48 too. Um, but yeah, all very good points made. Um, so I think that's it for uh, this episode. Again, Tanker, thanks for coming on my show. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I enjoyed talking to Matt with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, if you want to go follow him on Twitter, he's at Tenkor underscore seven one four four. He does hit five k. He's growing really quickly. Uh, so you go follow him on Twitter if you want to hear his takes. Uh, I enjoy his tweets. I think you'll enjoy his tweets too. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching. Uh, Tankor, any last thoughts before we head out? Thanks for having me on the show. All right. Thank you very much. See you all next week. Adios.